everybody. Welcome. You all made it here. I guess you all changed your clocks. <laughs> Good for you. Why don't you go ahead and stand as we open with worship this morning. Dearly Father, we just come before you and seeking you this morning and so grateful for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for all that you are, Lord. And we just lay our mornings at your feet, Lord. We lay our weeks at your feet. And you know, Lord, what each of us has gone through this week. And we just ask that you would come and wash over us, Lord. Lord, that you would be lifted up in this place. Lord, that you would be glorified in our worship. Lord, we just come seeking you this morning. We love you, Lord, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Failure doesn't face you. Worry doesn't win. Loss doesn't leave you. Afraid to start again. A sin doesn't shock you. A shame doesn't shame you at all. Mistakes do not move you. Terror doesn't tame. Death doesn't doom you to life in the grave. Our suffering doesn't scare you. Our secrets won't surprise you at all.
that is so big. Lord, bigger and greater than any fear, than any failure, than any struggle that we face, Lord. Let us fix our eyes on you. Lord, you are our strength. You are our high tower. Let us not worry about the waves that crash around us, Lord, but let us fix our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, Lord. You are the mighty God, and there is none like you, Lord.
are yours, but we belong to you. We are your children. We are your servants. You are our King, our Lord, and our Savior. And Lord, we worship you this morning. Lord, let us humble ourselves before you and lift you up. Because you alone are worthy, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Can you stand with us for this last song?
We just love your presence. We love the beauty of who you are, Lord. Lord, we just lay our lives at your feet. Lord, with open hands, we lay ourselves before you and just ask, Lord, that you would have your way in us, Lord. Lord, as we are yours, give us ears to hear your words this morning. And give us hearts that are truly humble and willing to listen and obey. We love you, Lord. We worship you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you go ahead and take this time and say hello to someone sitting near you. Good morning. How you doing, Tom? All right, let's go ahead and stop being friendly for a second. So, um, first of all, I guess I'd like to say the... Uh, it sounds like the Philippines mission trip went wonderful. They got back late last night around midnight. So if you see some of them around, ask them about their uh, adventure. And, and uh, I heard it was blessed. So, um, so let's uh, go through some announcements. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple and we'll hit them later. Um, first thing I wanted to mention um, is that we need to be praying for the Slick family uh, Anique 
uh, just got out of open heart surgery a couple days ago, and um, there's a sign-up table for when they get back into town. I think they're in Salt Lake right now, but when they get back into town, we want as a church family to kind of gather around them, and there's a, a sign-up table to help with housework, to provide meals, so and people will get in contact with you on when to help and stuff like that. So um, let's lift them up in prayer. Um, the Art of Marriage class is starting Monday, March 19th. I think that's uh, the weekend right after, um, what is it called, the conference they're going to? Oh, the conference is this weekend. Okay. And the following week, they're going to start the Art of Marriage class. That's on Mondays. There's also a sign-up table for that. Um, also on the women's ministry table, um, uh, there's a sign-up for an outreach to the Avamore community. Uh, I guess they're playing bunko, so if you're interested in that, take a look at that. Uh, also wanted to highlight uh, that we have a sewing ministry here. I think they provided some uh, clothes uh, to the missions team that went to Philippines. Um, and there is going to be a Good Friday and an Easter service, um, so start praying now on who to invite. I think we've got cards out on the table to uh, hand out to your neighbors, to your friends, co-workers. It's a great time to um, invite people to church, so um, look for that. Um, the Wednesday morning women's study has a new address, a new place to meet, so take a look at that. And um, finally, I wanted to mention that if you need prayer after the service, be sure to come up. Uh, there'll be a prayer team just to the, your right up here. Um, and finally, um, I wanted to introduce a video that we're going to watch. Uh, once a year, Calvary Chapel Eagle is, um, has always supported military Bible sticks. And uh, it's just, a, uh, I think, a really neat ministry basically providing the Word of God to in audio format to uh, those in the military. So um, with that, why don't we kick off the video, Darren? Given idea. Since faith comes by hearing developed the military Bible stick, tens of thousands of servicemen and women have had access to an audio Bible, no matter where they were deployed. But to think of these countries, every military person having the scripture. When we send our children out to war, we loan our children to this great nation. To give them any kind of device uh, that would encourage them to get into the scripture, to listen to the scripture, and, uh, anything we can do to help them. Uh, because they're, they're away from their homes, they're away from their families, they're away from their churches. Um, so this is a great idea, and I support it. Jesus sent the disciples out on that Roman road, and really that road system had been built so that the gospel, for the first time in history, could get to all the different languages and tribes and people. The 21st century Roman road today is technology. The Bible stick, you guys can have it in his pocket, and then they, they can get ministry 24-7. And then the uh, CEO said, it sounds like you found a chaplain in a box. No greater love has any man than to lay down his life for his friends. This is what our guys and gals are doing. They're laying down their lives for people they don't even know. We have hundreds of chaplains in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, National Guard that are lined up saying, please. This is the most effective tool that we've seen that reaches a young generation. Requests from chaplains are pouring in from all over the world. I don't even think they can produce enough of them. There's such a tremendous demand for them. They can't get them to these troops fast enough. Military Bible Sticks from Faith Comes by Hearing. Putting the Bible on the battlefield. says you never close the lid on those things and when I knock them down the water goes everywhere but I like baptizing people and things so 
Um, well, folks, this is something we don't do all the time. So uh, it, as the Lord puts it on your heart, and remember, we never have passed around it an offering. We never hold out our hands and ask you for money. We have an offering box back there as you want to give, but we trust the Lord in these things. And this is something we only do once a year to give you an opportunity to invest in something we think is well worth investing in, the military Bible sticks, where uh, they, you know the chaplains hand them out to uh, our servicemen and women in every branch of military, and they, we just give them to them. But they do cost money, so we pay for them. And so uh, with, it cost about $25 per Bible stick. If you want to help out, you could just write a check uh, to us and earmark it to military Bible sticks, and we'll, we'll designate it. What, we'll do, what we normally do each year is we add up how much is given, and then the, the church board, we decide how much to add to it, and then we send a large chunk uh, to Faith Comes by Hearing, the ministry that does that. We really like that, a great ministry. Okay, a, a couple other announcements before we get started in the Word today is, um, let's see, well, first of all, welcome back the Philippines team. You're here, right, the Philippines team? And if some of them didn't make it because jet lag, you know, but I've, I saw quite a few of them this morning, and we love you guys. We're, we're looking forward to hearing a report. We'll set it up either uh, portions of Sunday or Wednesday night just to get full testimony and reports of what they did. I really believe what the Lord is doing is, um, <laughs> I just got a text from Matt Slick. He's watching online with Anique uh, in, in ICU, and they're so grateful that we're we're uh, setting something up to help them out when they get back. Everyone say, hi, Matt. Hi, Matt. <laughs> hi, Anique. <laughs> we love you guys. <laughs> That's great. Technology, stop it. Stop talking to me. Uh, oh, what was I saying? The Philippine team. Oh, I really believe that, uh, you know, it's, it's time. We've been a church long enough that it's time we adopt our own mission field. And we've supported missionaries for quite a while now. We still continue to. We have sent teams out with other churches, but I really believe that this little village in the Philippines is now what the Lord is handing us, that this will be the mission field we adopt, that we're going to be ministering to them, and we'll be sending teams as often as we could. I think we should probably do more than once a year because we're the only missionaries they hear from, as far as I know, with that little mission group, uh, except a fringe group that I won't mention. Uh, but we, we will uh, do the best we can, and maybe you could be a part of that in one way or another. Also, uh, finally, the Easter flyers are ready, the uh, postcards, that's what they are. And we redesigned them this year, a little bit more colorful. Last year I had the, uh, what was it, the Easter side had a picture of an empty tomb, but it looked dark and gloomy and creepy. And so we made it so both sides are colorful this time. Good Friday, the, the, the dark and gloomy part was all pretty, and the Easter part was gloomy. So we kind of balanced it up now. And we've got about a 1,000 of these, and they're out on the table. And uh, don't worry about taking as many as you need if you're going to hand them out to your neighbors and friends and coworkers because we get a whole box under the table. We'll keep replenishing the ones on top. Okay, it looks like just a stack. Take as many as you would think you'll use. And pray about who you're going to invite to church on Easter. And Good Friday, by the way, we're having a Good Friday service. Look at the card, gives you all the information. Because, you know, there are some people, the only time to go to church, Easter and Christmas, right? And uh, that's the time the Lord says, I'm going to get them this time, you know. And sometimes they manage to sneak back out for another year. But I really believe this is the way the Lord gets a hold of a lot of people who are fringe. They believe in God, and they're just been kind of lack motivation, and hopefully uh, one of these services they go to and the Lord gets their attention, and they plug back into Jesus and start reading their Bible again and even even going to church and fellowship. So um, anyway, uh, use that, okay? Take advantage of that to reach out to folks. So we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We are taking, uh, this is called Let, the Lo Let Love Direct Your Spiritual Gift, part 2. Now, I have to say, um, my wife and I were talking on the way in today that I wonder what the visitors think when they come. You know, last week we had a lot of visitors. And what did they hear? About the gift of tongues and prophecy. Well, I got so long-winded, we never finished it. So guess what? Part two, the gift of tongues and prophecy. And here's the thing. 
for you visitors especially. This isn't what we're all about. We're all about Jesus. But I really believe in going through the scriptures. And when you're on a text of scripture, I don't decide I'm going to skip this part. And I don't decide, eh, this is, you know, just keep moving. Like, I, mean, I know some people do topicals, and then you never, you can always avoid the parts that you don't want because you just do topicals. Well, at Calvary Chapel, we teach through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and I don't ever want to go through a text of Scripture where by the time we finish it, you go, well, I, I, he didn't talk about this. I, I remember there are times I really want to know about something, and I'll get a tape, and I, there's a verse that really bugs me, and the teacher passes that verse up. But I want to know. Okay, I'm not going to do that to you. But the bad part is, you're going to hear about tongues and prophecy again today, okay? I, you do. You need it. Now, here's another thing I've got to tell you, is that I'm hearing that the growth groups, the small groups, are having lively discussions about these spiritual gifts. Because our growth groups, as you see, if you're visiting, you'll see we have fill-ins in the bulletin, and the growth groups go back and go deeper into the text. And, and there are strong opinions, and there are disagreements. And let me just caution you something. Don't be persuaded by strong personalities or strong opinions. Be persuaded by the Word of God. Because there are people who disagree on these things. Just make sure that whatever side you land on, it's not because your favorite guy or gal in the group believes that. You make sure it's because that's what the Word of God says. And you come to your conclusions based upon Scripture. Another thing you're going to find is some of you... Uh, grew up in Pentecostal churches. And, and you look at, re, read the shepherd's sheep. I put it all in there today. And, uh, <laughs> stop it. And, and you're um, in Pentecostal churches, and the Pentecostal churches have certain things they practice in certain ways. And guess what? You could use a legitimate gift in an illegitimate way. You could even fake things where it's not an illegitimate gift. There's all kinds of things that could go wrong when we talk about spiritual gifts. That's why we're taking our time in 1 Corinthians 14. And we're going to understand what does the Bible say. Please, can I ask you a favor? If you find that the Scripture says something that you never looked at it that way, change your opinion. If maybe you've always done things this way and you've always looked at it this way, but as we go through this, you find, hmm, no, the Bible does put it this way. Then change your theology. Change your approach. Change your practice. To fit the Word of God. That's why we gather. That's why we study the Word of God, okay? Father, we pray that you would just speak to us today through your Word. We don't want to just keep on keeping on in what we already believe if it's not true. Lord, we don't want to hold on to misconceptions. We don't want to hold on to old ways if they're not your ways. And we don't want to believe that the gifts have passed if they haven't. And so, Lord, just help us to be open to your Holy Spirit and open to your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, with all that, I hope you've already forgiven me for taking part two, and who knows, next week, part three. Who knows, okay? Uh, so just a little review of what I did say last week, and you need to get this, is that chapters 12 through 14 in 1 Corinthians cover the spiritual gifts, and sandwiched in between 12 and 14 is 13, Duh. And, and it's, it's called the love chapter. And it talks about the, the predominance, the preeminence, the supremacy of love. And it, there's a reason it's designed that way. Because, and I used to think, well, Paul just took a break to talk about love. No, he didn't just take a break. He's still talking along the same context that the spiritual gifts must be practiced in love. The whole purpose of the spiritual gifts is that God would manifest himself among us and show us his love, and build us up as a church. And if you do something and it, and, and it doesn't bless others, I don't, okay, let me just say it. Sometimes, yeah, I've been to churches where you're in the middle of a message and somebody just starts speaking out in tongues, blah, 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 and everyone's going, okay, they're freaking out. They get goosebumps on their goosebumps, and they go, what was that? But you, maybe that person goes away and go, I was so blessed to speak in tongues in church today. That's selfish. That's inconsiderate. Because you might be blessed, but you didn't bless everyone around you. 
And so the spiritual gifts have to be taken with the context of love. You practice the gifts and you do the things and you say the things that will bless those around you and you don't do the things that will freak people out, okay? Now, there's a proper time and place for every gift, so don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-tongues, but, but you won't usually hear in a, in a normal Sunday morning service, you won't, know, you won't hear a whole choir of tongues going off just because we follow 1 Corinthians 14. Okay, uh, let's see, what am I missing here? Verse 1 and 2 in, in the chapter 14, believe it or not, we actually covered two, what was it, two verses last week? We did jump around a little bit, but pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you might prophesy, prophecy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. And no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Okay. Here's the thing, your first fill-in for your small groups. And please, when you talk in your small groups, I know it's been heated. It's been spirited, one person put it. Uh, but seek the Lord. What is he saying here? Here's your first fill-in. One clear difference between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy is who you are speaking to. Verse 2 says, He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. And I'm, as we finish this chapter, I'm going to show you over and over and over again, Paul says this, that when someone speaks in a tongue, they're speaking to God. Okay, and I know you got questions. We're going to try to answer them. I did receive some of the small group questions that I'm going to answer today. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about tongues because many Pentecostal churches uh, you might go to and, the, and the, someone will stand up and speak in tongues and then someone stands up and gives a prophecy and people, the misconception is they think that the prophecy is the interpretation of the tongue. It is not. Prophecy is prophecy. Tongues is tongues. That doesn't sound proper English, but you know what I mean. And Because tongues is man or woman speaking to God. It's upwards to God. Prophecy is from God to man. It's clearly two different things, and it, I will show you this over and over again as we go through 1 Corinthians 14. And um, by the way, I've told you, I speak in tongues a lot. I really do. As a matter of fact, uh, today during worship, there's probably there's been times, I, I don't count, but there's times I'll just speak in tongues in, in our pre-service prayer. But you, there's a reason you don't hear me. I'm not talking to you. Okay? You think, well, I never heard you speak in tongues. That's because I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to God. Because tongues is not unto man, but unto God. And I love the gift of tongues. And we're going to answer more of your questions about it. But next, Paul begins to define the purpose and benefit of tongues versus the purpose and benefit of prophecy. And in verse 3, he says, He who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in the tongue edifies himself, as I was saying earlier. But he who prophesies edifies the church. And so here's another big difference is uh, who gets blessed from tongues? Who gets blessed from prophecy? Prophecy, everybody who hears it is blessed because it's God speaking a special personal word, word to us. Tongues, the person who's speaking in tongues is getting blessed. And everybody else is going, what do you say? Okay, unless it's interpreted, and we'll deal with that in a moment. Who benefits from each one? The church in general uh, benefits from prophecy. The individual who speaks in tongues benefits from tongues. And that's why Paul says in verse 1, I would that you all spoke in tongues, but most of all that you'd, you'd prophesy. And the one who prophesies is better off. Let's see, verse 4 says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He who prophesies edifies the church. Didn't I just say that? I'm saying what the Bible says. I know some of you grew up in churches and it's brainwashed in your head. You've got it a certain way. Consider with the scripture. If the scripture seems to contradict your theology, change your theology. You don't, exp I've seen this so many times. You find a verse and it seems to go against someone's theology and they find a way to explain away what that verse says. No, every verse says what it's supposed to say. You need to find a way how Every verse, they don't contradict each other. God says what he means, and he means what he says. 
I might not finish this one either. Okay. So, why and how does prophecy edify the church? Well, in verse 3, it gives you three ways that prophecy edifies the church, and this is your next fill-in. It says that he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. By the way, that's your fill-in, and if you don't know how to spell it, it's right there in your Bible. Okay? Just copy. And, and here's the three things that prophecy does. I'm going to explain each one while you're filling in the words, okay? Edification. Uh, it, it's building up. You know, uh, you look at a big building, it's an edifice. You know, uh, edification is to build up, or it's an act of one who promotes another's growth in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, holiness. Edification means I'm better for hearing that. I'm stronger for hearing that. I, my faith is strengthened. I'm built up in the faith. That's edification. Now, exhortation is a little bit different. Exhortation is, and I'm reading the definition, an appeal, admonition, or a persuasive motivation, a stirring address. So exhortation is, come on, you guys. We got to do it. Let's serve the Lord. Let's do what the Bible says. Come on, you guys. The Bible says this. Let's do it. The Bible says that. Let's live it. You know what I mean? Exhortation is like, Come on, move you forward to action, okay? Now, comfort. Uh, the Greek word for comfort here actually explains that any address, whether made for the purpose of persuading or of arousing and stimulating or calming consolation. That's like, whoa, I was pretty upset and I was worried about something. And I, then I, I heard that prophecy. <sighs> My mind was put at ease. Prophecy could bring great comfort. There's been times, and you've heard some of the prophecies I've received over the years, when I was at, at my wit's end, feeling like I'd been abandoned by God, and a man of God who had the gift of prophecy would speak to me words of comfort, that God has not abandoned you. He loves you. He's got a plan for your life. He's going to do great things and details to it, and it came to pass. And oh, what comfort. What comfort we receive from the spiritual gifts if they're used properly, okay? Now, something else I have to say, especially if you grew up in a Calvary Chapel movement or something similar to that, in, in the Calvary Chapel movement, I've heard people say that um, prophecy only does these three things, three things and nothing more. Uh, comfort, exhortation, and, uh, and edification. If it's not edifying or exhorting or comforting, it's not prophecy. I kind of disagree with that. Sometimes I go against my own plan, okay? Because, you know, if you think about it, um, I, I think that's a general rule if that's pretty much what prophecy does. But if you read through the Old Testament, for instance, have you ever heard prophets warn people and, and, and give warning of coming judgment? Or, or even like Agabus in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 21, verse 11, Agabus took Paul's belt and tied it around his hands, and he says, so will the Gentiles do to the man who has this belt. And it says, Agabus was a prophet. Now, that was comforting, wasn't it? Edifying? Was there anything exhortive about that? Go, tie your hands with a belt. No. It was a little bit of a warning, a, a foretaste of what was coming. So I think as a rule, <coughs> that the um, prophecy will bring edification, exhortation, and comfort. But I think there's times God will speak warning to his people. Or let you know what's coming. By the way, another thing is that it's not always people think prophecy means something, a prediction of something that's coming in the future. It's not always predictive. Sometimes prophecy is just the Lord speaking a word of comfort or edification or exhortation to you. Okay? So much to say here. So since we see that prophecy is from man, excuse me, prophecy is from God to man, it would speak very special and dear things to the hearer that you would walk away from that time of prophecy going, God spoke personally to me. And again, I've told you before, people say, well, you don't need that. We got the word of God. We do have the word of God, and I cherish the word of God. And you know I love the word of God, but I'm also glad that God is not restricted, that he can't speak to me personally if he wants to. That's prophecy, okay? And we know that tongues are a prayer life from man to God, but it also can be inspirational if it's translated properly. Again, some of you came from a Pentecostal background. 
this is the first time you're hearing this. I mean, tongues is only a prayer. I, I've heard times where people prophesy, excuse me, speak in tongues, and then a prophecy comes forth. Well, someone was inspired enough to give a prophecy. That's not the interpretation of the tongue. I've heard stories of people say, well, I, I was at a meeting once where somebody spoke and, and another person understood it, and it was, it was sharing the gospel. Well, that's interesting. But that's all it is to me. Interesting. When I hear stories that people say, yeah, but I know a person who, and they tell you a story, but it goes against what you read in the Scripture, I just go, well, that's interesting. But I'm only going to teach what the Word of God says. And the Word of God says the tongues is, is from man to God. And that's it. Now, that's why Paul says in verse 5, I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied, uh, because he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in the, with a tongue, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Uh, now, a couple things I want to say here. There's several things in verse 5. One is, Paul didn't forbid sp tongues. He goes, I wish you all spoke in tongues. I know some of you are freaked out right now and wish you didn't come to church. I understand that. But let me tell you something. Calvary Chapel is never going to say, wait, before you leave, grab you and shake you. Blah, 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 speak in tongues. Blah, blah, blah. I've seen churches that do that. Okay, repeat after me. Abba, dabba, do. You know, we used to joke about it as young Christians. We lived in, uh, in Southern California near Redondo Beach. We'd say, all right, now say, go right on my Honda down Redondo, Redondo Beach Boulevard. You know, I'll say it real fast, go right on my Honda. Or retie my bow tie. We'd make all kinds of fun stuff up, you know. Uh, but we don't do that. We don't manipulate. We'll never put you on the spot like that. I ended last week's service by telling you a story that my wife came from a very strict Baptist background. I was Calvary Chapel, and as we were dating, she just started studying it. I didn't force it on her, you know. And she just started studying it. And one day she went into a room as I dropped her off after a date. She went to her room and started studying it. And she started worshiping God. And she began singing in tongues. Now, that's the way it should be. Nobody's forcing you. Nobody, don't wait, repeat after me. No, you will not leave the room until you, no, 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 no. I want to tell you something. If, if we finish this series, uh, this text on, on the gifts of the Spirit, and nothing happens in church that you see is different, but you go home and seek the Lord, and you find He begins to give you, reveal your spiritual gifts, I'll be happy. We're not looking to get crazy. We're not looking to become a circus. I just want you to have everything God has for you without forcing or manipulation, okay? Now, so Paul says, I, w I wish that you all spoke in tongues. So let me give you a couple verses on that. Because uh, later in this chapter, Paul will conclude in verse 39, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. I know churches that say, tongues is of the devil, and if you speak in tongues, it's demonic. Oh, God help them. Read 1 Corinthians 14, 39. It's, it, it's, there's a proper place and time for it. And he says, we're not to ever forbid it, Okay. And again, I think maybe even in your small groups, there are people who will tell you, because they came from that kind of background, that those gifts aren't in operation today. I see no evidence in Scripture that tells you they stopped, or that, and we already dealt with that a couple of weeks ago. Now, when the church gathers, it's different. Paul says, I wish you all spoke in tongues, but not right now. I feel the same way. I wish you all spoke in tongues, but not right now. We're having a Bible study right now, okay? I'm not saying, you know, you visit some churches, it's almost like the, the pastor fires off a gun and everybody goes for it. Blah, you know. We're not one of those, okay? In, in church, 1 Corinthians 14, 19 says, in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. That's why it's all about love. It's all about what's going to bless people around you. How are people going to be blessed most in church? from the teaching of God's word, maybe even from a prophetic word. And if you get a prophetic word, usually I believe prophecy is either for an individual or a group of people. If it's for an individual, wait for the right time and catch him after church. If it's for a group of people, well, we do want to hear about it, okay? So just make sure you're hearing from the Lord and don't turn anything to a, into a sideshow. Uh, now, 
interpretation we're going to deal with in a moment. Um, but verse 5b says um, that you, I'd rather in the church and you not speak in tongues. It says, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. It's all about edification. Edification is all about love. Okay? We're about blessing you, not freaking you out. Okay? Now, when a tongue is interpreted, the church will be edified. And, and what will it what will it be like? I mean, look at verse 12 in this chapter. It says, even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you may seek to excel. We, you want to bless each other, not just bless you, okay? Now, what might an interpretation of the tongue sound like? If it's not a prophecy, if it's from, from man to God, what would an interpretation sound like? Well, I think it would be like a beautiful psalm. You know, you like reading the psalms? Why would you want to read the Psalms? It's just somebody else's prayer to God. It's not your prayer. Well, it's really, it, we get built up by the Psalms. We get blessed by the Psalms. I, I was looking for one that might be a good example, and Psalm 30 is a good example. Psalm 30, verse 10 through 12. Hear, O Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. I, I would think that if someone spoke in tongues and it got interpreted, it would sound something like this. You have turned me from my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed, clothed me with gladness. To the end of my glory uh, may sing praise, uh, excuse me, to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. I think that's what an interpretation of a tongue, according to the scripture, would sound like. Now, a, a, another question came up in the growth groups. Does... Uh, the gift of tongues always need to be interpreted. No, no. But if you stand up in church and speak out, it doesn't bless anybody unless that's interpreted. You know, uh, like I said, today, probably during worship, during our pre-service prayer, there's been several times I've spoken in tongues and nobody interpreted it because pretty much nobody heard it but me. I was talking to God, not you, right? And, and so it only needs to be interpreted when it's brought forth in public in the church. Um, verse 5b right there. It says, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Look at verse 28. <clears throat> verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. I think it's not saying talk, talk to yourself. I think it means under your breath. You know, it doesn't mean just go talk to yourself. It means I'm to speak to myself and to God. It means like I speak in tongues quite often. I'll be around people, but they're not here. I'm just kind of, they think I'm mumbling or something. But I'm talking to myself quietly and to God. It's me praying to God. It's a wonderful gift. I'm so grateful to be able to do that. Uh, but, but another question would come up, since you said that, Pastor Mike. Why in the world would I want to pray to God in a language I don't understand, right? I know you're thinking that. I mean, why do I want to talk to God in a language that I don't understand? That doesn't make any sense. Well, for one thing, um, I don't think we've got the words. There's things in our heart. I mean, unless you're an expert linguist and you could just write a speech right on the spot, there's times that if you ever want to pray and you're going, uh, I, um, you know, because we don't have the words. But another thing, there's a verse that kind of, explains this in my opinion it's Romans chapter 8 verse 26 Romans 8 26 says likewise the spirit also helps us in our weaknesses for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God I believe there's times we don't know what to say, and, and, and when you have the gift of tongues, you could just, the Holy Spirit's translating what's going on in your heart, and then translates it to speak to God, and it's a wonderful thing. And matter of fact, in Romans 8, it actually says with groanings too deep for words. You might think I'm getting weird here. I am, I am weird, but listen. I think that there's even times you just go, oh, oh. God knows exactly what you're saying. Well, you could moan in the spirit. You could groan. You could go, oh, oh. You don't, God's not going, speak up, boy. What are you trying to say? 
God's not going, you know, like some guys do when their wives are crying or emotional. What's wrong with you? If we go, oh, he says, I hear your heart, my son, my, my daughter. Groaning is too deep for words. You see, speaking to God in a language that you don't understand, it's just because you don't have the words to say what need to be said. And the Holy Spirit has a way of interpreting it so that you could express yourself. It's a real outlet. It's a real release in the Spirit. Now, verse 6, as we speed through this. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Now, here's another thing that comes up. Paul's already made clear in verse 2 that tongues is from man to God. And so none of these things here are tongues, but he's saying if I'm going to speak in a tongue, which, by the way, tongue could be either mean a language. I mean, it means that's what it means is a language. And so depending on how you put it in the sentence, you're speaking about the gift of tongues, or you're speaking about just speaking with your tongue. And Paul says, when you're speaking with your tongue, these are the tongues that help, that do any good, is prophesying or teaching or, or revelation or knowledge. And, and so he's saying here that, you know, none of these things are tongues, but this is where it should go. Uh, uh, you know, another, another question, by the way, came up from the growth groups. And please, growth group leaders, keep sending me the questions. If something comes up in your growth group that you go, okay, there was a big problem here, here's what it is, email me, and I'll make sure we cover that in the, in the following Sunday, okay? And so one of the questions came up, is prophesying teaching? The answer is no. Prophesying, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a definition in a moment if you could write fast, but pro, uh, the answer is no because verse 6 even shows you there's two different things, right? It says uh, if I speak to you with my tongue, how can it bless you unless I'm prophesying or teaching? Meaning they're two separate things. Okay, it says it right there in verse 6. There's two different things. Now, let me give you a little definition defining the two. And by the way, if you belong to a growth group, we send the growth group leaders my notes. And if you can't ke keep up or you can't get any of this stuff, I ask for a copy because they could print it up for you, hopefully. Uh, preaching and teaching are the means of expressing and explaining what the Scripture says. Preaching and teaching are the means of expressing and explaining what the Scripture says. That's what teaching, preaching. Now, prophesying, prophesying is directly proclaiming the mind of God in a personal way. I'll say it again. Prophesying is directly proclaiming the mind of God in a personal way. And the Holy Spirit leads believers to express truths which always are in, in agreement with the Scriptures. If somebody comes forth with a prophecy and it disagrees with the Scripture, then that's a false prophecy. That's how cults are started, by the way. A cult starts when some man who claims to be a prophet brings a new revelation, and the, the people who are hearing it aren't discerning and aren't studying their Bible, and they hear this new revelation, and they go, yeah, He's the prophet. It must be true. But later, and we won't get to it today, later it says that the two or three prophets can speak in church. And so you must. You don't all have. But when you do gather, only allow a couple, and the rest should pass judgment. The rest should discern and go, is that from the Lord? And they'll either say, amen, that's from the Lord. Or they'll go, mm, that goes against the Scripture. We have the right to disagree with prophecy. That's the weird thing about some Pentecostals is a guy speaks or a gal speaks who says she's got the gift of prophecy and nobody will question it because they're a prophet. No, you test all things and prove what is true by the word of God. Okay? And so always test it by the word of God. Now, here's your uh, next fill-in and it goes along with verse 6. Uh, Paul is saying that these are four things that benefit any church gathering. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through this and give you the fill-ins, okay? Number one is revelation. Revelation is the divine realization of truth. Have you ever had the light go on when you're in church? You hear something, maybe you've heard it before, but you never really got it, and you get a revelation during a message or during a time together, and you go, ding, and you go, whoa, I, I get it after all this time. I'm slow like that. That happens to me from time to time. Number two, knowledge is gaining a deeper understanding and a fuller comprehension of truth. 
You know, sometimes we know things or we just know it. But when, when the word of knowledge or, or actual gift of knowledge comes forth, you go deeper. You, you get a fuller understanding. Number three, prophesying a, is a personal experience of the mind of God revealing his purpose and plan for you. Now, I know the Bible gives us his purpose and plan, but prophecy is more personal. The reason why prophecy hasn't passed away is because there's times God wants to say something to you, as he has for me in the past, where I could look in the Bible and I could find all kinds of stuff, but God, I need to hear from you personally. And I've told you stories where God has spoken personally through somebody with the gift of prophecy, and I needed, oh, I needed that. It was personal. And so New Testament prophecy is, is directed to an individual or a group of individuals. It's never doctrinal. It's, it's never like, I've got a, a new prophecy. For now on, this guy's going to start a new religion, and he's your new leader. And it's like, no, that, you don't start, you don't teach doctrine, you don't change truth with prophecy. Now, number four, teaching. These are four things, remember, that, that everybody benefits from in a church gathering. Teaching, an explanation of doctrinal truth. How do you get doctrine? Not from tongues, not from prophecy. You get doctrine from the gift of teaching. And that's why we go through teaching on Sunday mornings. All right. Now, let me read you the, the following text that we're in. Uh, and Because and, it, it could be kind of like, at least I've read it so many times, after a while I'm just reading it and not listening to it. So sometimes it helps to read it in another translation. New Living Translation, starting with verse 6. Don't look at your Bible because you'll lose, you'll lose it. As a matter of fact, we'll probably put it up on the screen for you. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring to you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. Even life, lifeless uh, instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how does the soldier know that they're being called to battle? He's just saying the importance of clarity. Okay, continue. Verse 9. It's the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you're saying? You might as well be talking in empty space. He's talking about the difference between tongues and prophecy. Verse 10. There are many different languages in the world, and every language has a meaning. But if I don't understand a language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it. And the one who speaks it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true for you. Since you are so eager to have special abilities the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. Over and over again in this chapter and other chapters, you're going to hear, do what's best for the whole church. Do what's best for others. Bless others not just you. You know, you don't leave church going, I was so blessed this Sunday at church when I jumped up and down and screamed hallelujah and, and started speaking in tongues. Uh, you might have been blessed, but everyone else around you got freaked out. And so always when you come to church, you're coming being considerate and to make sure that what you say and do, your behavior is to bless others. Control yourself if you're an emotional type of person who likes to get out of control. Now, I don't mind if I'm teaching something and somebody says, amen, and hallelujah. That's okay, you know. Yeah, preach it, brother. I mean, but just be careful, because if you do that, I'll just start getting louder, and I'll just start, I'll go longer. Don't do that. You'll make me, I'll go longer. I, I'm just telling you, you get me all worked up, okay? All right. <clears throat> so the, the bottom line here is using your spiritual gifts in love. And I don't just mean, well, I love God when I did that. No, I mean in love considering one another, in love of your brother and sister. Uh, this verse 12 says, Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you may seek to excel. I like the way the message translation, translation puts that verse. Since you are so eager to participate in what God is doing, why don't you concentrate on doing what helps everyone in the church? Isn't that nice? Okay, so verse 12 drives home the priority of let love rule when we gather together. Let love be our, our rule for everything that we do. Verse 13, 
Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Oh, you know, it took me a couple of years to catch what Paul was saying here. I used to think, because I've visited a lot of Pentecostal church, churches, I used to think you'd, you'd go to church and somebody speaks in tongue. Now everybody's got to wait around. Okay, who's going to interpret that? Guess what? Read verse 13. It says if you speak in a tongue, you need to pray that God gives you the interpretation. Hmm. So be careful. If you speak out in tongue in, in this church, I might just say, all right, brother, let's pray that God gives you the interpretation and wait. Because that's what 13 is saying, isn't it? That the responsibility is upon the person who's speaking in tongues that he needs to pray. Now, I know some of you Pentecostals are going, that's not the way we did it. In my well, then they did it wrong. Okay? Let, let's read the Bible. Okay? Now, later, Paul's going to lay down the rule in verse 28 that if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. Again, I've said that before a, a couple times. But that's the rule of thumb that Paul gives out. Okay? I know some of you are going, but what if you can't help yourself? I can't help myself. I've been to churches like that. Somebody just goes out of control and they say, but I couldn't. The Spirit came upon me. I've told you before, from my study of Scripture, and I'm going to give you a verse in a moment, from my study of Scripture, the only time the Spirit comes upon you that you can't control yourself is a demonic spirit. Huh? When the Spirit of God comes upon you, you are under His control, but you're also under your control. What do you mean I'm under my control? Let me give you a verse on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32 and 33. Because it's in this whole chapter. I want to look ahead to what's coming. Paul says, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. What he's saying is, if you have a gift of prophecy and you are a prophet, you are in control. And maybe even you get a prophecy, you get something right now, right while I'm teaching. You, you, you can go, you know, I'm going to save that. and I'm going to talk to Pastor Mike later. Or this is for so-and-so. I'm going to talk to them later. You can control it. That's what, that's what 1 Corinthians 14.32 says. Spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. And you go, that's not what it means. Read the context. It is what it means. Paul is saying, look, don't ever let anybody say, I couldn't help it, so the rules don't apply to me. You know what I mean? That's what people do, basically, in a Pentecostal church. I, when I was a young man, I was studying this. I went to Pentecostal church. Everybody was speaking in tongues at the same time and going out of control. And I went up to this dear old lady sitting next to me. <laughs> she was probably as old as I am now. And, and I says, Ma'am, it says here that if anyone speak in a tongue, it needs to be only with interpretation and, and, and only and one at a time. And she goes, oh, young man, you just don't understand the Holy Ghost. We will excuse our behavior by saying, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. I couldn't help myself. I was in, in the Spirit. But you're not in the Scripture, okay? The Bible treats us as if we've got control and we've got choices to make. And we have the ability to obey the scriptures, and that's all I'm telling you. Now, you can have some more lively discussions in your small group, okay? Uh, we're, we're just about finished here. Uh, I wanted to go to verse 19. I don't know if I should, um, can I just read through it? Let me just read through it, okay? Because I, I don't want to do a part three here, okay? Um, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Again, look what tongues is, prayer from man to God. Um, verse 15, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, speaking in tongues. I will also pray with my understanding, speaking your language that you, English, okay? Uh, I will sing in the Spirit, singing in tongues. I will also sing with the understanding. You got a choice. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Keep reading verse 16. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen to your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? Stop, I have the points that mount verse 16. What is tongues? It's blessing. Did I highlight that? Yes. What is the gift of tongues? It's blessing God. It's giving thanks to God. That's what 
the Bible says tongues is. And you'll see it's supported over and over again if you're paying attention. Verse 17, for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Did I do it again? Yes. What is tongues? You indeed give thanks well. That's what tongues is, okay? No, but when I, when I speak in tongues, it's a preaching. No, preaching is preaching. Tongues is tongues. Sounds, sounds in proper English, but we'll keep going. Okay, verse 18. I thank God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Now, I wanted to finish this, and here's your last fill-in, and, and that we won't have to do a part three on this, but we will move to verse 20 next week, okay? The gift of tongues is an enabling to pray and to worship. I don't see it saying anything else in the scripture but that. I don't care what your past, your pastor of the past or the doctrine of your other church or what they did and what it looked like. And uh, I'm just going to go by what the Bible says, okay? Prophecy is an enabling to speak the mind of God in an application to someone's personal life. Just give you more stuff to talk about in your small groups, okay? We're, we just went two minutes over, so we're going to close here. But let me again remind you, we don't usually say, if you want the gift of tongues, stand up, we're going to pray for you, and you would start doing yabba-dabba-doo. And we're not going to do that. But let me tell you something. Just like what happened to my wife, you could say tonight or after lunch today or whenever you want, I'm going to go spend some time with the Lord, and I'm going to pray. And I'm asking the Lord, Lord, if there's something you have for me that I, I've been ignoring or, or avoiding, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to run from you, God. I don't want to, uh, I, I want everything you have for me. And I don't want to make excuses or run away or give a yeah, but I, I want everything you have for me. And that's all I'm asking as your pastor. No manipulation, no weirdness. You seek the Lord. Because I totally trust God that if you seek him, just like he did with my wife, when we had two different views, she sought the Lord, she stopped worshiping him that night, and she started singing in the spirit. God is able. I'm going to trust you into his hands, and I'm going to, I'm going to look forward to the Lord just making us more and more a spiritual people that God would manifest himself through the gifts of the spirit. Let's call the worship team up, and let's close in a song. Father, how we need you. And Lord, I pray for myself as well as your people here, that we would never be afraid of anything that you have for us. We would never skip over a text because it's confusing or I don't believe that text. Lord, I know your word is true. So help us, Lord, to always be open to what you have to give us, what you want to do in us. Lord, maybe there's something different. Maybe, maybe there's somebody here that's just been so long in a certain mindset that they think there's no change now, it's too late. Lord, help us to be willing even in our old age, to change if you want us to change, to receive if you want us to receive, to speak in tongues if you want us to speak in tongues. But Lord, we only want what you want for us. And so we're open, Lord God. Let's all stand. And as, as we sing this song, allow the Lord to just fill you. I hope your heart and your attitude is of this mindset that you're saying, Lord, I want what you want in my life. Let's sing this out into the Lord before we dismiss. Holy God. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Holy God.
Lord, with your Holy Spirit. We love you. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, if you do need prayer this morning, our prayer team is up to your right. God bless you guys. Stand alone.